Today we're going to continue in our study of the series on the book of James. And we've entitled Caution, Faith at Work. Today we're entitled the message Faith and Patience with the controlling thought being living faith produces genuine patience. It's living faith that produces genuine patience and brings victory into our lives. The world today is full of impatient people, isn't it? <clears throat> you see them every day, standing in line at Walmart. How about 45 miles an hour, you're stuck behind the car going on 286. How many would get that one? You know, uh, people who can't wait for the light to change. You know, we just sit there and they honk their horns and they get all upset that the light won't change. People can't wait for the waitress. When is she going to get here and take our order? We've been here five minutes. You know, uh, people who want what they want when they want it, and if they don't get it, they throw a tantrum. Right? Isn't that the way this world's going? I want what I want when I want it, and if I don't get it when I want it, watch out. The whining comes out, the head button comes in, and lay on the floor, start kicking and screaming. Any of us who have had children or grandchildren have lived through that, you know, that tantrum phase. When Barack Obama was elected in 2008, the right was talking about voting him out in 2012 because he was going to destroy the country. And the left was fearful that the white supremacists were going to assassinate him before he'd even had 100 days in office. Well, here in 2016, Donald Trump has been elected, and the right can't wait to undo everything that President Obama did while in office, and the left wants President-elect Trump out before he even gets in. You know, impatience. <laughs> we want what we want when we want it, and we want it now, or we're going to throw a tantrum. Impatience has a power to destroy. And we see that happening right now. You know, with the riots, personal property being destroyed, character assassination, right and left. Now that the candidates have stopped assassinating each other's character, it's their followers that are assassinating the character of the one that lost and the one that won. You know, it keeps on going. We have seen impatience in the world bring about great destruction. I want what I want when I want it, and I want it now, and if you don't give it to me, I'm going to bring destruction upon you, nation to nation, country to country. Any of us that have children have seen it. We've seen it in our children when they want what they want and don't get it when they want it. They throw their tantrum. But we've learned that if we teach them patience, they learn to delay their gratification and they learn in the midst of the struggle of wanting what they want to be patient for the outcome that they can earn. James is talking to his scattered church. They're in the midst of a lot of persecution. And they're upset. And they're getting impatient. So James wants to talk to them about being impatient. This attitude of impatience was affecting the church then and affects the church today. What are you talking about? What are you talking about impatience in the church? We're not an impatient people. Mm. People cause a fuss when they don't get their own way in the church, don't they? I have known people to stop giving their tithe when they don't see things happening in church the way they want it to happen. I've seen people stop coming to church when they don't see what they want to see happening in the church when they want it to happen. I've seen people get offended when they don't see things happening that they want to see happen when they want to see it happen and that being now. People destroy others if it's not their way. I mean, we've seen it. People forget that no aspect of the church has anything to do with me. 
Church has nothing to do with me. Church has nothing to do with you. Church in its constitution issued by Jesus himself when he called the disciples together and gave them the commission to go and witness, basically told them church is about two things. Church is about worshiping God and serving God. Coming together has nothing to do with us. Paul lambasted the Christians that were coming together and leaving out the poor when they shared their meal together. He said, it's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about us and them. It's about worshiping God and serving God. Some people are so settled in their impatient ways that they try to dictate to God how he can and will work in the lives of his people. You know, when you see that, you know, you best get out of that church. (laughs) Because it's not going God's way. It's going some man or some woman's way. This my way attitude will destroy Christian victory. The victory that Christ won for us on the cross will be destroyed by this type of impatient attitude. James is writing to his congregation who've been persecuted, financially destroyed. They've relied on the promise that Jesus said, I'm coming back. But their trials have them numb. They didn't think they were going to have to go through this. And even if they thought they would have to go through it because Jesus said we would as believers, they didn't think it would be for very long because Jesus said, I'm coming back. Every day for them then was another day of a broken promise because Jesus didn't come back because they thought he should come back now and rescue them from their trials. He said he would come back when he ascended into the clouds. He said when he came back, he would set up his kingdom. But that was years ago. Persecution, trials, troubles had set in. They were losing hope. Their faith was slipping. And it was almost dead. Because they got impatient, waiting for Christ to return. Dr. Anderson, in his commentary on James, says this. A French philosopher said, Patience is the art of hoping. Patience is the art of hoping. And he said, I like that. He says, it's the best definition of biblical patience I know. When our pain threshold is reached, we need to hope to hang on to. The right hope can help us endure the pain. A little bit later, he says this, Why did James spend so much time telling his people to be slow to speak and slow to wrath? He said, James wouldn't have told them that unless they were doing it. (laughs) They were being quick to speak and quick to wrath because their patience had been tried and they were losing hope. If patience is the art of hoping, he says, then we know they had lost their hope. For where there is no patience, there is no hope. Conversely, where there is no hope, there is no patience. And that is exactly what we find in James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. Those people were evidently having trouble with patience, primarily because they had lost their focus on Christ's return. Their hope was in being delivered from their suffering when Christ returned. James wanted to restore their patience and endurance by teaching them the art of hoping. In verses 7 through 9, he says this, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. 
The judge is standing at the door. Living faith produces genuine patience. Genuine, victorious patience has at least three elements. Patience that brings victory is goal-oriented. Patience that brings victory is motivated by grace. And patience that brings victory is guided by obedience. As we look at the first, goal-oriented patience. The first thing that we notice from this passage is that goal-oriented patience, or just plain patience, is commanded by James. The word that he uses are words of command. They're not optional. When he says, be patient then, my brothers, he's telling them they've got no choice. Christ's command is that they be patient. And the word used here is a compound word. The first part of the compound means to preserve, to be patient, to wait long. The second, or the, the first part, that, that's what the, the word patience means. Uh, and the sec, it's the compound word in the first part meaning large and intense anger, burning wrath, or explosive rage. When joined together, the word refers to the act of holding back one's anger. We might say such a person has a long fuse or can keep calm and cool in the midst of the fire and can keep calm and cool without exhibiting frustrations or difficulties with the situation. So being patient is number one commanded. Number two, it's talking about some serious emotional stuff. You know, they don't get angered easily. They don't get frustrated easily. Did you know that frustration is just another word for anger? We think they're two different words, but they're not. <laughs> they're both anger words. They're both words of reaction. And so James is saying, be patient. Don't engage in those things. Second, as he's looking at goal-oriented patience, he says goal-oriented patience keeps its focus on the future. We have patience and patient expectation on the promises of God. Another word for that is hope. Goal-oriented patience has at its core that sense of hope. It has been said, though, that expectations are premeditated resentments, and this is only true if the expectations that you have are in people, places, or things. When you have an expectation upon God's promises, there's never disappointment. Because God always fulfills his promises. No matter what is bringing you stress and discomfort in this life as followers of Jesus Christ, we look forward with expectation to the eternal existence where there will be no stress, and there will be no distress, and there will be no discomfort. James apparently understands that patience won't come easily to his friends won't come easily to the church that's under such pressure. So he repeats the commands. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. So he's saying, what are we supposed to be patient with regard to? Be patient with regard to the hope that you have in the sure and soon coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we're goal-oriented, our goal is getting to heaven. And if our goal is getting to heaven, anything that's going on here are just insignificant bumps in the road. They don't keep us from getting there. So we shouldn't give them more importance than they're due. He said... The Lord's return is coming. And this has a pregnant sense of, he suggests it says a goal as well as a time period. The goal is his return, where he'll set everything right. And it is coming, but it's not here yet. So we have to hope in what's coming. And that helps to build our patience. James says that we are to exercise patience as we wait and look for the Lord's return. We want what we want, and we want it now. 
And so, Jesus, if you don't come now, I'm going to get upset. <laughs> and I'm going to get upset at these little things that really shouldn't be taking that much energy out of my life. Because after all, you promised you said you were coming. And you haven't. So I'm getting angry at you and I'm getting angry at them. And James says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus is coming. He promised. And you can bank on his promise. Put as your goal to be focused on his return. The Lord's return is near. They had been waiting. They expected it in their lifetime. James is saying, the patient person has the long term in view and not the short term. The person who learns victorious patience begins to remember and remind themselves that even if it's for 70 or 80 years, that's nothing compared to eternity. And so let's stay focused on our hope. Our goal is to get to heaven. And our goal is to be good witnesses here on earth. To a child, when October comes, Christmas is so far away. But to the gray-haired grandma who has already been on check twice and Amazon and all these other sites comparing the best prices and shopping, Christmas isn't just almost here, it is here. And we got to get prepared. When we have our hope fixed and we're working toward the goal, we're not focused on how long away it is. Because we're preparing for it. And that's what James is saying. If you're preparing for your hope in the future of Christ's return and eternity with him, You've got the long view. And with the long view comes the ability to have patience. Goal-oriented patience, James says, can be seen in the farmer. The farmer hopes in God's provision. He knows that he can only do what he can do. He can't make it rain, and he can't make the sun come out. He can't do anything to make his crops grow. All he can do is prepare the field and plant the seed and maybe put some weed killer down. Everything else is up to God. And so he waits on the provisions of God. He hopes in the provisions of God. He provides what he needs to provide in obedience to God and then waits for him and trusts in his sovereignty and awaiting his reward. Obedience brings the reign of blessing to the farmer, but to our lives. And obedience brings the reign of righteousness when we obey our righteousness, our righteous relationship with God increases. Goal-oriented patience develops uh, perseverance. When you have a goal in mind, you have an end date, when you have an end date, you can put up with anything. My dad was in, the, was in the Navy, was in the Army. He ran the house like it was his platoon. We had our rank structure. Our allowances were based on our ranks. And we had our jobs and our assignments that we had to do. And we got, we got our stripes. We climbed up in the rank structure. So I was prepared a little bit for basic training. What my dad told me before I went was, this is the one thing that I want you to remember. No matter how tough it gets, it's only 16 weeks. You can put up with anything for 16 weeks. It was 8 and 8. It was basic and advanced training. You can put up with it. I was surrounded by a lot of guys who didn't have that advice. And when things got rough, because you always have that one. You always have that one that wants to buck the system and get the drill sergeants upset. And guess what? He doesn't get in trouble. Everybody gets in trouble. And so you get tired of getting in trouble for everybody else. But you just remember, it doesn't matter how many push-ups I have to do, I'm free from here 
in 16 weeks. <laughs> and when you have that goal orientation, you can put up with a lot of the stuff. We had people leave. And today they get stress cards. <laughs> if it's too tough, just put up your stress card and you get to get away from it for 20 minutes and calm down. And you wonder. And colleges are taking that into the college now too. If it gets too stressed, you've got to have a safe zone. And did you see that article in the one college? I guess, I think it was Yale. The professor said, oh, they're just so upset over who won the election that we're not going to take the test. We've got to give them time to calm down. <laughs> so like, what? What about life, right? Goal-oriented. Patience avoids complaining. James isn't talking about you complain to your buddy here and there about how messed up things are. He says it's a spirit of complaining where all you do is gripe and whine with no answers and no solutions. You don't have anything to put forward except everybody else is doing it wrong and it's everybody else's fault and you're messed up because it's everybody else's fault. Complaining doesn't hasten the return of the king so sitting there complaining, when are you coming back, Jesus? When are you coming back? Doesn't help him come back any sooner. He's going to come back in his own time. He says, because ultimately complaining just catches you and sticks you in the mud. It doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't get you anything. If you're not pro proposing solutions and you're just whining, it's not going to help you at all. And ultimately, the judge is coming back and he's going to fix everything. So just... Fix your goal and patience on him. Living faith produces genuine patience because when we live our faith with the focus on the future return of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be able to begin to develop a patience that will bring us victory in the time of uncertainty, fear, and persecution. The development of victorious patience is possible because we will come to know and understand his will will be accomplished. His desires will be accomplished. And they'll all be accomplished in his time, not our time. We don't have to push him like the impatient spouse who has to poke and prod the other mate. Because Jesus is going to do it in his time. James explains this with another illustration. He says, brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. The first thing he's saying, we have to have grace-motivated patience. Our patience needs to be full of grace. He says, first brothers. And by saying first brothers, he's saying we have to yield to God. And we have to yield to his grace so that we can give grace. And then he says, look at the prophets. They came and they were persecuted for speaking things and speaking truth in my name. But they yielded to me and because they yielded to me, they developed patience, which was able to give them grace and not lash out at those who were persecuting them. He says, even if it means persecution, offer grace to others. Obey me but obey me in a way that you're offering grace to others. He says, we have to persevere in prayer, not for ourselves alone, but for those who are persecuting us, those troubled times that we're going through. Look at Job. Job prayed. He was in great distress, but he prayed to God. He maintained that relationship with God. Look at Elijah. He prayed for rain to prove that God was the God of all creation. And God glorified himself by answering that prayer and bringing the rain to end the drought. We must receive from the Lord compassion and mercy so that we can give compassion and mercy to others. We are to extend it to both followers of Jesus Christ and those who don't follow Jesus Christ. Living faith produces genuine patience because when grace is a motivating factor in our treatment of others, we will develop patience with them and for the circumstances of life in which brings the stress. When people are persecuting you, when you offer grace to them, it helps you to be patient with them because you realize that but for the grace of God, <laughs> there go I. 
Living with this type of patience brings victory over the stress, over the fears, over the uncertainties of life. And then James says, Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, or you will be condemned. He's not saying we can't say in the court of law, yeah, I'm going to tell the truth. He's saying you shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to. He says, if you're guided by your obedience to God, and that's what we're talking about now is guided patience, guided by our obedience to God, we live lives of obedience to God, others will see it, and we won't have to need to swear our oaths. J. Vernon McGee said that when he was a child, his dad was getting a loan from the bank, and the banker had set up an appointment for him to come and pick up the money and sign the papers. When his dad got to the bank, the banker said, I've been too busy to get the papers drafted. Here, just take the money and come back another day and sign the papers. And J. Vernon, he said, my dad said, but I haven't signed the papers yet. And he said, your word is better than the signed paper because I know if you say you're going to get the money back to me, you're going to get the money back to me. You know, that sense of integrity that's there when we're obeying God and our guided patience is guided by our obedience to God, then we have that integrity that integrity that will guide us in our everyday life, that we will be in a, a, a person of integrity who you see what you see is what you get. Remember those bumper stickers, Hawk, if you like Jesus? <laughs> yeah, well, I read a story in preparation to this. There's a guy, he's a Christian, he has that bumper sticker on the back of his car, he gets stuck in a traffic jam. And he's just getting frustrated as all get out because he wants to get going and he can't get going because there's all this traffic. Somehow the guy that was behind him is able to snake his way out from behind him and, and move over to the side. Another guy comes up, pulls up behind him, and they're stuck in traffic, and they're not moving anywhere, and he goes, beep, you know, just a nice little tap. He goes, you know, what's this guy honking at me for? I can't move anywhere. And so traffic is still sitting, and, and the guy that honked didn't get a response, so he honks a little bit louder. This guy gets so upset, he goes out and he, what's this guy honking at me for? I'm going to give him peace of my mind. He goes out, the guy rolls down his window and said, I love Jesus. I'm honking to tell you I love Jesus. <laughs> Obviously, that guy's life wasn't having a whole lot of integrity that day, right? He said, I love Jesus. Honk if you love Jesus, and we're going to be okay together. But the frustration of the situation caused him to lose his integrity. James is saying, if our lives are guided by obedience to God, then we begin to develop that patience. Living faith produces genuine patience because when our patience is guided by our obedience to God our Father, we know that he will work all things together for our good, even when we can't see any path for good to come from the situation that life has brought to us. When our patience is guided by our obedience to God, our Father, we will be able to talk the talk and walk the walk with integrity that points to our hope and the integrity of God's promises. Living faith produces genuine patience. Genuine, victorious patience has at least three elements. Patience that brings victory is goal-oriented. Patience that brings victory is motivated by grace. And patience that brings victory is guided by obedience to God and our integrity in that relationship. What does that mean for us today? There are four things that I I'm going to suggest to apply to your life. Pick one of them and start applying it this week and see if it doesn't increase your patience quotient. Doing right when you've been done wrong. That might be hard. Let's see if that might work to help you gain patience. James desires us to shift our attention from what is happening to us to what God is forming in us. Instead of looking at what God, what's happening to us, look what God's doing in us because of what's going on around us. And the one connected to that, patience is important because it allows Christian growth in the midst of difficult times. Instead of looking at the difficult times as a hindrance to your walk, Look at it as a growth potential and see how you can grow when those hindrances and difficulties are affecting your life. And the fourth one is we should not judge others even if they are a source of the difficulties that we face. Don't judge them because who knows that God didn't bring them into your life 
to sand away some rough edges. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. and Thank you for this time that we've spent together in your word. May you work within us that we can take the truths of James as he spoke them to his congregation who were losing their patience. And may we take these truths and apply them to our lives so that we can have a patience in you that brings victory to our Christian walk. If we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's greet one another.